Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. This is Tally Simic Knight. I am here together with my co hosts, Robert Powell and Frauder Superabo. This is Magic Occult Radio. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Aaron Leach. Aaron Leach is a very accomplished author. The books he has written include The Essential Enochian Grimoire. Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, Angelical Languages, The Complete History and Mythos of the Tongue of Angels. Uh, and so there, there are lots of books out there. So I'm really excited about this interview and uh, lots of great stuff uh, that we should look forward to this evening. So uh, how are you doing today? How's the weather up there in Florida? It is very rainy. <laughs> very rainy. Very yeah, rainy, yes. It kind of opened up on us today. There's been all sorts of weird weather patterns going on down here. So. Yeah, we got some rain yes. here, too. I'm also in Florida at the other end by the ocean, and they said that there was a big rain cloud from Ohio all the way to Florida. It's crazy. It was yeah, 80 so degrees fine. yesterday. I'm in Maryland. It was 80 degrees yesterday, and now it is about 35 and re- freezing rain, so it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, here in, here in Texas, here in Texas, it's been, like, really weird, man. Like, all of, out of nowhere, it got really cold. It's been raining here in Texas, too, so, yeah. It's like I thought it was springtime, but, you know, you never know. So, just to have... Uh, some type of uh, structure or direction to today's podcast. Uh, we were thinking we could, uh, I was thinking we can go into classical magic. And uh, just to start off, I'm kind of curious, uh, Aaron, like what uh, got you started into the more classical magic, like grimoires and things like that? Oh, wow. I, I think that goes back to. Uh when I was uh, out west uh, living in Denver, Colorado. That's where uh, I first ran into uh, uh, I ran into my first group of the opening and some weekends and shamans and such. It was a pretty active to me now. And uh, I was, you know, I was just being, actually, I think, uh, yeah, it was one of them that actually did me my first copy of Don Craig's Modern Magic. Um, I was really into, uh, I was wanting to learn more about the Kabbalah at the time. Uh, and so they, they recognized that as I was looking for so that's kind of where everything started for me not just the classical magic but it all kind of really uh, really kicked into gear right there I guess that was about 93 and um, that's where I first heard about the Grimoires I mean I mean, outside of fiction of course but uh, uh, even there they were kind of uh, uh, almost, almost fictional or almost legendary is what I should say because you couldn't find anyone who knew anything about them or owned them. Uh, all you really heard were, uh, you know, dark and scary legends about them being, you know, the kind of magic that the Old Testament prophets were using, of course, which didn't turn out to be true, but that's how they were described. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, this is how you call down the archangels or called up the demons, depending on if you were using the white book or the black book. And, you know, it was all very dark and mysterious. And, you were, you know, it was supposed to make you afraid, and you know, it's the kind of thing you didn't want to mess around with. And of course, that was exactly what piqued my interest, and I realized I needed to learn about those books. So that's where, you know, from there on, it was just a matter of searching for those books. I found out that the, the what they were calling the White Book was, of course, the Key of Solomon, and what they were calling the Black Book was the uh, the Lamegaton of the Goetia. And um, as I said, none of them really turned out to be as dark and scary as the legends. There was the local legends and uh, urban legends uh, indicated. But, um, yeah, that's definitely where my search began. And, of course, as I was discovering the text and learning more about them, I, I, as I recall, Don Craig even goes over a few of them in the, in the later uh, lessons of his book. So um, that's where it began for me. And uh, I began to collect the texts that I could find, began trying to put them into practice. And... Um, it wasn't very long after that, honestly. I mean, I mean, maybe within months. I think I was back in Florida by '94, and um, at that point, I was on my own. I was disconnected from that community, and um, it was around that time that I met uh, Oshani Lele, 
uh, also known as Stuart Myers, and he is a, uh, or at the time he wasn't, he was just beginning, but today he's a, he's a Santo. And as he was delving into Santeria and Palo Mayombe and the various ATRs or the African traditional religion, and he was learning more about them, um, I was learning from him in turn. And he went away for, I mean, it might have been two or three years, as I recall. And he actually went away to be initiated and rise up through his uh, through his house and get uh, sainted, get crowned with his uh, with his patron Arisha. So he came back a fully initiated Santo, and that was right around the time that I was gearing up to uh, attempt the Abramelin operation. So. I found myself going to him uh, for hours at a time. I would take the grimoires to him, and we would sit there. I would sit there and go over them, and I would explain to him, "Well, I found this in this old ancient, you know, text here, like Abramelin or the Key of Solomon or something like that." And I'd say, "This doesn't make any sense. Why? Why do they need to do this? You know, why do they need the eyes of a frog or the brain of an eagle? Or, you know, why do they say you have to do this to us? If, if the spirits are all just parts of your mind, then why do you have to?" approach the spirits in this specific way and not do this and do this and I don't understand all this it just seems it seems ridiculous but then he would respond well no we do the same thing in, in the, the African religions too we, and here's why we do it so little by little I was able to start making sense of these of what I now call the old magic and the instructions and protocols uh, especially in the book of Abramelin um, if it hadn't been for him and his knowledge of crowning ceremonies, I don't think I would have ever been able to perform the Abramelin operation. And by this point, we're at 97. So uh, it was during 97 that I performed the operation, and basically everything else from there is history. So that's where it all really, really began and, 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 and launched in earnest for me. Wow, that's uh, quite an amazing journey. Um, there's something you mentioned there. You said if all of these spirits are just different aspects of my mind and that kind of touches on you know there's this psychological model of magic and then there's like more of the spirit model so would you say that the grimoires uh, would you say that they do not operate under the psychological model or would you say that there's some misunderstandings or with that or what is your view on on that with the grimoires well, I they absolutely do not work on the psychological model. In fact, that that was where I was hitting the biggest roadblock. And when I would take these books to Oshani, and I'd say, why do I have to do this? You know, I, I, it doesn't make sense if this is all in the mind. And it, the first thing he had to teach me, or I guess teach me, he had to tell me that this is not all in your mind. You know, here in the in the ATRs, in my tradition, I would say, we don't, we're not, we don't see these spirits as parts of the mind. We don't see them as coming from ourselves. They're objective, they're real. And because they're real, that's why you have to do X, Y, and Z. And once you kind of drill that into my head, that regardless of what I believed at the time, and at the time I was very entrenched in the psychological model, um, but regardless of how I viewed it, the authors of those grimoires, the, the man who wrote the book of Abramelin, the, 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 the people who wrote the Keys of Solomon, they were not viewing it psychologically. There's nothing in those books that they wrote down from the psychological perspective. They were serious, you know. And uh, so I had to break that. I had to understand that in order to make sense of what I was reading. And once I did, it all started to make perfect sense. Well, it looks like a lot of people try to work with the grimoires or with these spirits that, you know, this is just like a guided imagination or... It's kind of like an inner path working or like it's all just a psychological type of thing. And would you say that that's more of kind of a, a postmodern world? Would you say that that's part of the difference between the classical magical worldview and more of our postmodern view? Yeah, we, we generally put the cutoff between those two in the 1800s right around the founding of the Golden Dawn. Um, that was, you're, you're looking at a, it, right there, you're looking at a world that's, uh, it's after the Enlightenment. Um, uh, people are, are beginning to get a very scientific, materialistic viewpoint of things. And psychology itself was very new at the time. Uh, you might recall that the Golden Dawn has a, a clause in their oath that you're never supposed to allow anyone to hypnotize you. I mean, yep. hypnotism was so new at that time, they still believed 
that a man could hypnotize you and get you to do anything. You would be totally under their thrall, like in a sci-fi story or something. So, yeah, it was all new and exciting to them, and they really thought that they had figured it all out, that all the old texts and everything had really just been psychology texts. It had really all just been archetypal and aspects of the mind. And so the Golden Dawn developed their system that way. And then now I don't, uh, obviously I'm a member of the Golden Dawn. I don't uh, have a problem with them um, having the psychological model because with the Golden Dawn and anyone who followed them, you know, you look at the Lima, you look at uh, Denning and Phillips and their work and all these other groups that came after, they were heavily influenced by them. They're all surgic systems. They're all systems designed to change you inside. And, you know, like in the Golden Dawn, there is no magic in the Golden Dawn. You don't even get to magic unless you pass the Outer Order uh, tests and initiation and then go into the inner, their Inner Order. So it's fine that their system is psychological because that's their focus. They're focused on the individual and changing the person and making them an adept, an initiate, who can then go on to practice the real magic. Um but anything before that, anything before the Golden Dawn and before that particular era in history, uh, yeah, you're not going to see psychology in this. Now, I'm not saying there's no psychology. I mean, the human mind and how it, interfa- and how it interfaces with the universe is it's very important. You have to know yourself. You have to know your mind. You have to know how it works, how, it, uh, how communication with spirits takes place. This is all aspects of the human mind. Um, but none of those old texts saw the entity as just projections of ourselves. They, the, the spirits were real. The angels are real. And when you use the magic and you follow those protocols that they give, you get results that uh, make it very hard to <laughs> see this material as purely psychological. I can tell you that. Well, hey, uh, I... Yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay, Aaron, uh, just a real greater super bravo here. Pleasure to meet you. Um... Just uh, want to kind of uh, piggyback on 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 that really quick. As someone you, you mentioned, uh, Don Craig's book, uh, Modern Magic, as someone that that worked through that book, um, and and I found it very helpful uh, as a beginner magician. I think it kind of did exactly what he intended it to do, mm. as uh, you to be able to pick up any book of magic and be able to understand terms and things like that. And, and he did go into um, the uh, uh, the the goetic style magic uh, but it was very psychological uh, but mm-hmm. I, I remember um, kind of along the lines of something you were saying uh, it just didn't w- when I was attempting to do it feeling that way like it's in my mind it just it didn't feel right it didn't necessarily feel right to me and um, I, I, I always had this leaning that like you know it, one it's just so much cooler if it's something outside of yourself and two that it's just, uh, you know, there's just more, fe- I, I just got more out of it, and then results started to come, uh, very much like yourself. And uh, we, as, as Talizan asked about errors, uh, not errors, eras, and, and the postmodern era and, and things of that nature, do you see a, a resurgence of, of this spirit model coming around now? Like, uh, to me, it just seems like more and more, it's, we're, we're circling back around to that, uh, um, uh, uh, the spirit model, seeing these as actual separate entities. Do you, do you, can you comment on that? Do you, do you see that happening as well? And what's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's actually a book called um, Crossroads, I think it was called. I have, to, I have to look it up now, but it was an anthology uh, that was put together. I contributed a piece to, and it was all about that, how the modern movement is swinging back toward uh, the older views. And especially how uh, the African traditional religions are having a massive impact on uh, on uh, modern Western occultism. So back when I was talking uh, to Oshani Lele late into the night, um, I was the only one. You know, like I, I performed Abermelon by myself. I had no one but him to refer to, um, and no one was using the grimoires. In fact, you'll notice that my first book is called Secrets of the Magical Grimoires. That's not what I called the book. I called it Secrets of the Grim Wars. Llewellyn added the word magical because they didn't believe anyone would know what a grim war was. <laughs> so that right there is a good indication of how things have changed since then. And, I mean, it, you've heard the phrase, when it's time to steam engine, it's going to steam engine. I think it was really time for this occult revival, and uh, this old magic revival to, to happen. I mean, 
uh, you see the world is changing in a massive way. You know, when when everything was nice and comfortable here in America, we could sit on our high horse and be philosophical and poo-poo all the you know the little natives running around doing their folk magic, and we had it all figured out because it was all just in the mind. But as soon as our government goes to hell, the economy crashes, wars start breaking out all over, the rise of fascism is 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 facing you know we're facing that right now. The world's getting a hell of a lot more dangerous, and people have real problems that they are now concerned about. So suddenly, all of this, oh, it's all just in the mind stuff, is starting to break up. People are going back to their instincts a little more. Another thing that I noticed, uh, I pointed this out before too, is right around this time, uh, when a, a lot like my book had just come out, uh, Jake Kent was just starting to really uh, catch on and become popular, and. Um, and right then was when Katrina uh, hit New Orleans. So, right in the middle of this, uh, uh, j- just just for example, um, I don't I don't want to divert too much, but uh, going back to Oshani Lele, uh, he's a white man, and when he was initiated into his house, this was a controversy. This was something that was discussed and deba- debated heatedly in their community. Should white people be allowed in? Now it's common. They're all over the place, and 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 that's because of Katrina. Katrina literally caused a second African diaspora so that all of this hoodoo and voodoo that had been centered in New Orleans and Louisiana suddenly got spread across the United States and the world. I mean, people from New Orleans went all over the place. And with them, they took their, they took their system and their wisdom and their magic. And I mean, all of these things have all come together, the change in the world and the new, just the internet itself and the new access we have to talk to each other and share ideas. Um, and by the way, there's no such thing as cultural appropriation of magic. That's nonsense. All magic is syncretic, uh, and we learn what we can from each other, and what culture you come from doesn't matter because magic is the same the world over. So we're learning a lot from each other now that we weren't previously. So all these things have come together, and people are looking back over the past you know, 100 years or so and thinking, well, maybe this, this psychological model thing, maybe it fit its time and place, but maybe it doesn't fit now. Uh, the way it used to and people are starting to return like i said they're going back to their instincts they're going back to something more primal and when when your family is facing problems when you've got financial difficulties you're not sure if you're going to be able to keep your home you're not sure if you're going to be able to see your family you're not sure where your next meal might be coming from then the psychological stuff goes away and you start asking for help real help that can make real changes in the world and that's what we're looking at right now well, you know, um, like um, in in my own videos and things that I do, I always try to be unbiased and like, you know, everyone has an opinion and stuff like that. But mm. in my own view, like this is, I think that the psychological model could be very dangerous when you try to bring it to grimoires. I don't want to go into all the details around it, but the first time that I worked with the Goetia, the Ars Goetia. I was 19 years old, and I approached it as it's all just in my head, it's psychological, and I got horribly burned. It was it was horrible. And I've heard of many other people that also have negative experiences when they try to apply the, you know, it's all in my head. And some people, like, they never seem to have any major issues but still, I, I think it could be very dangerous. I think it's important to look at these things, you know, these, these spirits are real. And that that is the reason that the equipment is needed because, I mean, you're dealing with a technology, you know, the, the various aspects. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, I mean... Uh, a person uh, coming from, say, the Golden Dawn, a Thelemic system, and they want to uh, practice with the Key of Solomon, and they come at it as a psychological thing. Okay, maybe eight or nine people out of ten, they'll be fine. They'll use that, and they'll have their nice psychological experience, and they'll move on. But the question is, who are you, and how are you wired? Um, and then, like I said before, your belief doesn't really matter that much. You may believe it's all in your head, but if you happen to be sensitive, if the spirits can reach out and connect with you and you start employing these older methods 
thinking that it's all going to be in your head, but you're you're wired in such a way that you can perceive them, and suddenly they show up, or something else happens, you know, or a negative result to a request that you make comes, through, or whatever mistake is made, something happened that really shows it. Oh my God, this is real. And let me tell you that many a fundamentalist Christian has been made by that exact experience. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've seen it. I mean, the thing is, like, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, even if nine out of ten people are fine, they're like, I've been doing this for years, and I'm fine. Like, I have, you know, I've gotten emails of horror stories, like horrible. I mean, it's not a fun experience, you know. It, I think it's important to approach this with the proper reverence and and respect, so yeah, so that's part of the reason that I really, I mean, there are lots of authors out there, but that's part of the reason that I really appreciate your work, um, because you're starting to bring things back to more of a classical worldview when working with these spirits. Um, I found your essentially Nokian grimoire to be literally the best book out there. Uh, modern author, um, hands down. Awesome, thank you very much. I'm glad it's been yeah. useful. <laughs> hey, Robert, uh, you had some kind of a question about two forms of evocation or, or something. What was that? Well, a while back, uh, maybe a year ago, I was, I believe it was you, Aaron. Yeah, yeah it was you. And you said that there are two forms of spirit evocation more of a shamanistic version and the exorcist version of evocation. So okay. I'm interested in hearing that, at least in the context of the time. I don't know if it's valid or not. Um, so, uh, or if you still follow that dichotomy, but do you still follow it? Yeah, well, actually, um, I can't take credit for that. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of myself because if you read Secrets of the Grim Wars, there's no mention of that in there. I, um, when I wrote that, uh, which was, I guess, in 98 and 99 is when I wrote that, I still hadn't come to this realization. So it was actually Jake who pointed the, uh, I'm sorry, Jake Stratton Kent who pointed this out to me. Um, and he said that, uh, if you look closely at the Grim Wars, there's two currents. It, it's not so much two styles of evocation, though I think it does amount to that. Um, but you're actually looking at two different groups of people is what he's saying, uh, writing the Grim Wars. Um, the one hand, you have uh, your exorcist, uh, the medieval exorcist, the guy who worked for the church. Um, it was his job to lay hands on new converts as they came in to cast demons out of them. And it was also his job to be the town faith healer. So if you got sick, you know, you had a choice. You could either go out into the country to find the local wise woman or witch and take herbs and medicines from her, or you could go to the church and they would exorcise you and try to cast the, de the demon of sickness out of you. So this guy, this exorcist, had to be a, a, a successful faith healer. I mean, if he wasn't good at what he did, he wouldn't be in that role. Um, so these guys, when they were writing their uh, their magic, um, and you see this like in the Key of Solomon and the Goetia, these are the guys who wrote the spirit curses. Uh, they're the ones who take the very high and mighty... I am the image of God, and you will do what I say, or else I'm going to dangle you in an iron box over this fire until you know until you comply. Um, because that's unfortunately, and and this is really a whole different subject. I have issues with the Catholic methods of exorcism, but they uh, one of the techniques that they would employ is uh, for a human. If you were being exorcised, they would tie you down and literally torture you. They would make you physically uncomfortable and cause you pain until the demon in you couldn't stand it anymore and would flee. Um, this still goes on today. Uh, if you ever hear stories, they'll come through the news every once in a while. Somebody in Africa murdered somebody during an exorcism. Um, you, that's usually what's happening. They're torturing the, the person, trying to drive out the spirit, and they go too far and kill the person. So obviously I have issues with that form of exorcism. But that, those are the techniques you're seeing in the spirit curses in the Grim War. You take the sigil of the entity and you consecrate it and you link it to the entity and you pierce it with pins and you burn it with fire and you seal it in iron boxes with stinking fumes and hold it over the flame and all that horrible stuff. That's exorcism. Now, the other group of people writing the Grim Wars 
Um, for example, uh, a lot of the material in the first book of Agrippa's Three Book of Occult Philosophy, um, uh, chapter, uh, at least in Mather's edition, it's chapter 23 of the Key of Solomon, uh, which concerns making sacrifices to the Spirit. Uh, these sources, these are written by an older group of people. Uh, basically, it's holdovers from the ancient pagan practices. Um, you know, so like, for instance, in chapter 23 of the Key of Solomon, there's not a triangle and a circle and threats and torture. Uh, you're told to set up a table and lay out a feast and actually sit down and have dinner with these entities and ask them for what you need and tell them that if you'll give, if you'll help me, then I'll give you more offerings later. And it's pleasant and it's friendly and it's respectful. That's the older group that's writing that. They treat the spirits with respect and honor because, uh, you know, these are the old gods, these are the gods of nature that we're talking about. And the Christians just called them demons. Uh, but, you know, well, actually everyone called them demons. Demon just meant spirit. But the Christians decided that demon, quote unquote, meant evil spirit. And they called them all evil spirits. Um, and so that's what you're seeing in the Grim Wars is literally a conflict going on between these two groups, often in the same text, like the Key of Solomon. You have one chapter that tells you to torture the spirits and another one that tells you not to. <laughs> so over the years, I've kind of developed uh, more of a, I leaned more toward the older group. The older group, by the way, that's Goetia. Uh, when you hear like Agrippa or one of the other Grim War authors talking about Oh, those evil necromancers, those goets, those howlers at the moon, their evil, dirty ways. They go out and work with the spirits, and the spirits rush to them to serve them. The spirits can't wait to give them everything they ask for, and they're evil for that. But us, we treat the spirits with disrespect. We beat them. We torture them. And if we get anything out of spirit, out of the spirits, it's only because we force it out of them, and that's why we're better. <laughs> so you see, this, this is what you're reading in the Grim Wars. It's actually a, a conflict between these two groups and these two philosophies. And like I said, I've, I've leaned ever closer toward the old Goetia philosophy, the old treat these spirits with respect, feed them, build working relationships with them, because that's where the magic comes from. I've tried the other methods. Believe me, I did way back when I was young and stupid. And if you torture an entity sigil, you know what you're going to get? A pissed off spirit. <laughs> you're going to get an enemy on the other side. It's not going to do what you want just because you're torturing it. In fact, it's, you're going to get the opposite. And you're going to put yourself into a war mindset. And now you're at war with all of the entities of the underworld. And you don't want to go down that road. I mean, that's the Catholic way to be at war with the with the underworld. But that's not, that's not the reality of the situation. You don't want to adopt that mentality. Isn't there, um, isn't there more of... A middle way, for example, if you look at the Greek magical papyri, there's compulsion, but it doesn't seem to be as – I'm not sure what the word is. It, it, you do see a certain level of compulsion and stuff with some of the entities from the Greek magical papyri. But like you said, it's not like they're putting them in a stinking box and holding it over a fire or something like that. What do you think about uh, that? It's a, it's a little more about the technology, and it kind of depends on the spirit, too. You know, like, if, when I'm dealing with the archangels or my holy guardian angel, there's no compulsion there. Um, like, like Agrippa says, they're not compelled to come down here. You invite them down here into objects that they find pleasing with incenses that they find pleasing and foods and nice things. But then the, the spirits of nature, the lower spirits, like your familiars them you have to be a little more forceful with. Again, you're not going to disrespect them, but you are in charge. You're the boss in that situation. You're the client, and you're the one that has them working for you. So um, you can take a commanding tone in the right places. You can be in charge. Of, I mean, when you, when you, especially in Goetia, Goetia uses the Grand Seals, the Grand Seal of Solomon, the Hexagram of Solomon. There's a thousand names for it, but it's usually a very elaborate symbol uh, inscribed on parchment, and it has to be done in a certain way at a certain time. And this thing becomes your badge of authority. And if you're dealing with the spirits of nature or the underworld and you're holding that badge of authority, it's like you're a cop. You are in authority now. You are speaking for God. You are an ambassador for God, and you're speaking with that authority. So you can be commanding. But that doesn't mean you can be disrespectful. I mean, ambassadors don't get very far if they if they abandon the uh, the the arts of uh, diplomacy uh, and just become rude and threatening and and hateful. 
So yeah, there are places to be to be commanding, um, and there are places to not be commanding. Right. So it's more, um, you know, you're still in a, in control and authority, uh, but you're not disrespecting, and um, and so like more with just like wild forces sometimes need to be directed and controlled, right? Kind of like that. Correct. And and especially with the wild forces, the earthly forces, the, the spirits of nature, um, they're just like any other uh, living being. You know, they want to have shelter, uh, companionship, food, and sustenance, and to be comfortable and to be happy. And they want to expend as little energy getting those things as possible. So... Whether you are training a dog or you are working with a contractor or working with your spirits, in any of those cases, um, oh, I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm, I'm totally losing my, my train of thought here. Um, what, what was the question you just asked me? I'm sorry. Well, um, like wild forces need to be directed. And because um, you were oh, talking that's right. about sorry, you can that be was a total... authoritative, you could be authoritative. Right. Like the boss, but without and that was being a, Yeah, and that was a total brain fart on my part. Sorry about that. I, I totally, I totally lost it. But uh, yeah, so you can be in control without being disrespectful, just the way an ambassador can do, or a police officer if he's arresting somebody. I mean, you'll have police officers that go out there and pull out their gun and yell curses at you and scream at you. And they usually don't make it very far. Unfortunately, they make it further than they should. But they shouldn't make it very far acting that way. Whereas an officer who can actually do his job calmly and with respect to the people that he's working with is going to get a heck of a lot further. So like in a grimoire, for example, sort of this middle way would be to use the conjurations of a, with authority and, and all of this while basically putting out a pleasant offering at the same time but you're still using the conjurations and, and basically being the boss essentially yeah you're basically going to be in control and you know like I said they want to get the good things from you without having to work for them as hard so um, that's where I lost my train of thought regardless of what you're, whether it's an animal or a person like, or an employee or anything that anyone you're trying to train to work for you they're going to want to get the maximum out of the relationship and 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 for the least expenditure of energy back. So um, they, they can get lazy. And if they can take control of the situation, you know, I want more offerings. OK, well, now I want more offerings. And then, OK, okay now for the same thing you asked for last week, I want more offerings and, and I'm going to put off working for you. Well, you know, I would have done it for you, but I need a little bit more and I need a little bit more and little by little. They'll just get to the point where they're in control, and now they're demanding from you. Oh, how come you didn't? How come I didn't get the money I needed to live this week? And and they'll say because you didn't make X, Y, and Z offering. Make those offerings, and we'll take care of you. You don't make those offerings, and we'll punish you. Now you've gotten yourself into like what you saw in the Old Testament with those gods. Thou shalt give me ten thousand bullocks per day, you know, and and otherwise I shall take your land from you and send your people scattered across the, the, the nations and punish them for generations into the future because you didn't do what I... So we don't want to get to that situation. You have to stay in charge. You're so the Aaron, human. You're, and it's, mm -hmm. it, it's like they're forming a, a, a magical spirit union against you. And you're the, you're, you're the magician or the, uh, the, the, the business owner and, and right. they're organizing and the strike the against you. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to organize the con and if you if you are a terrible, terrible employer, if you neglect them, you don't feed them, you don't take care of them, but you demand, demand, demand. See it works both ways. Then yeah, they can union up on you. They can just say, Look, we're not working with you. And then you, you lose your spirit contacts, they leave you. But on the other hand, it can go bad, like we were just talking about, the other direction. They can demand more and more and produce less and less. So then you have to be the one to say you're not producing. Goodbye. I, you're fired. And I've done that before. I've had familiars, and I've said, "You are." I had one familiar that just loved to push my buttons. He figured out how to make me angry, and I'm a kill, so it's not hard to make me angry. 
And he figured out how to do that. And he loved pushing my buttons, man. I, I, I caught on to it after several weeks that he was doing it, and he was actually laughing. He was having a ball. And when I came to that realization, I said, get the fuck out of here. I will never speak your name or write it again. Nobody outside of me will ever even know what your name was. Go back to hell and tell Lucifer why the fuck you just showed back up there. <laughs> and I have never spoken to or, or spoken the name of that entity since. And uh, that entity was replaced actually quite a while later. But uh, he was replaced. And it turned out, this is, this is funny, the replacement spirit had been with me since I was a child. And I knew that because of the name that he gave me. And I had not known that it I thought I had made that word up as a kid. And it turned out I hadn't made the word up. It, it was it, The name actually meant something. I had to look it up, and that's what told me what was going on. And he had been with me since I was a child. So it's almost like this other familiar had just been a placeholder anyway. And I had to take it upon myself to say, I'm not letting you do this to me. You're not working for me. You're taking control of this, this relationship. Get out of here. And once I dismissed him, and like I said, it was quite a while. I think it was several years before I finally went and got a replacement for him. And this one was my spirit and always had been. It was really funny. And since then, the results I've had it have been incredible. Now, what do, that, you think, um, what do you think about more of the uh, – yeah, sorry. Uh, what do you think more about the approach of just – well, like some people working with the Ars Galicia, but they cut out all the circles, they cut out the layman's, they cut out all the tools and everything, and they just like basically get a layman and just light a candle and then like, but like they give an offering. Like, what do you think about that approach? The problem with that is um, someone who, okay, someone who tries that is basically putting the cart before the horse. Um, and what I mean by that is when you look in the Grim Wars, you are not looking at instructions for how you must work with spirits forever. The Grim Wars, and this is why they're called grammars, this is why uh, they're called beginner's books, and it's also why the keys of Solomon are called keys, because they just unlock the door. They contain spells and methods by which you gain contact with the spirit. So take the Goetia. You're going to summon, I don't know, Andros, and you've never summoned Andros before. You do not know this entity. This is a stranger to you. So you have the circle, the triangle, all the tools, all the regalia, the incense, the the, the hexagram of Solomon, and all the, the, the pentacles that you're supposed to use. This is the technology by which you open the gateways between the physical and spiritual worlds, contact that particular spirit, and call him and stay safe from him because he's an unknown spirit. That's what the circle is for. That's what the triangle is for. Uh, you don't really know him yet, so you're going to talk to him, and you're going to ask him for a familiar. You're going to ask to work with him. You're going to ask him to give you a familiar that you can work with. And uh, from that point forward, now once this is done, you've gotten a spirit from Andres. You've gotten a, a little mini on, Andres for yourself. You've put it in a brass vessel. Now you don't need all those tools in the circles. Now you've got a vessel you can put on an altar, set offerings and candles and incense in front of it, and just talk to that spirit anytime you want. So can you sit down there just with a lawman and a candle and talk to a spirit? Yes, but it's kind of stupid to try to do that before you've actually called the spirit and made a deal with them and actually have that spirit there in your house. Otherwise, you're just looking at an empty talisman and talking to yourself. So all of those all of those things are used to establish that initial contact and link. It's kind of like setting up like you each have a mode of communication, like you're connected, and then it's easier. So it sets up communication, but also it is protective, like the circles right. and all that is still protective, I guess, because that initial contact could be hazardous. Possibly, if, if you don't know the spirit, it doesn't know you, and there hasn't been a relationship established yet. Correct. And, of course, remember now in the old days, I, I don't really deal with this much because it hasn't been an issue. But at least in the old days, they were very concerned with spirits showing up pretending to be the spirit that was called. Um, I think they were a little over paranoid about that. But um, 
a lot of that protection and a lot of the triangle. Remember, the triangle is there to get the spirit to tell the truth, not to help it manifest or any of that stuff. The triangle is there. Um, it even says that in the book, if you think the spirit is lying, then draw a triangle and command it into the triangle. Or some of the spirits that will say, you have to summon the spirit into a triangle or it will lie to you. But that's the point of the triangle. So it, it's about trust. And, you know, let's say you, you summon, you know, Beelzebub or something, and you don't really know how he's going to react to you. You don't know if he's going to lie to you. Uh, you don't even know if it's really Beelzebub that's going to show up. Um, and again, this is the mindset of the medieval mage. So you summon the spirit, you put it into a triangle, and then you start all of that, you know, who are you? What is your name? What is your sig sigil? You know, do you serve God? Do you serve this entity? Do you serve, you know? And you work out who the entity is, and then, of course, you go into your petition, what it is you want the spirit to do, um, and how that relationship will be built. And then once the deals are made, um, you know, just like at the end of Abramelin, you summon the spirits and get an oath from them. And once that oath, once that deal, that contract has been made, um, then you don't need the circle and all of that stuff. Now you've got an under, you've got a working relationship and an understanding. And also, yeah, too, uh, I should, oh, I was going to say, I was going to add on to the end of that. Um, speaking of the medieval mindset, don't forget, uh, like when you're looking in the Goetia, that ritual setup is not just for those 72 spirits. Um, you're actually intended. You'll notice that the prayer for the triangle uh, to Michael says, Michael, bind the spirit which disturbs this place into this triangle. So you're actually intended to take that stuff with you over to, over to people's houses when they say that they have hauntings or if someone's possessed. And you're supposed to actually conjure the spirit out of the house or out of the person and into the triangle and into a vessel so that you can take it out. So so there's your you context. Can, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you can you can use the triangle to pull in poltergeists or, or whatever else that's being troublesome, basically. That is absolutely its intent, yes. Because remember, these guys, they did this stuff for a living. I guess kind of like I do nowadays, but... That's what they did. They, you know, you, you would have a, a, a possession or someone would get sick in your house and you would see that as a possession. Or you would think that your house was haunted and that you would go to the, to the local Solomonic magician, whoever that was, and they would come over with the book and the, you know, the holy water and all that stuff. And they'd draw out the circles and they'd actually cast the spirit out of the house. And if they were really good at what they did, they probably then took it home and put it to work. But <laughs> either way, their job was to actually relieve you, the client, of the, the afflicting spirit. So that's what a lot of that art, especially in the Lamegaton and the Goetia, is really what that's aimed at. It's an exorcist uh, technique. Well, you know, um, uh, with the Nokian magic, I mean, I really, I really loved your essentially Nokian grimoire. Like I said, it's hands down the best books I've read on the subject. But... Um, so in a in a Nokian magic like this came up like you know I'm I'm in like some Enochian groups or I used to be and it's like a lot of people have the attitude that you know you don't really need all these tools you know it's just you know it's like it's all just in your head like you can just you don't really need a a, a ring or holy table or any of that but like in in uh, John D's system, like basically, correct me if I'm wrong, but you use these things to establish contact, especially, and uh, once you go through your 19-day, 18-day period, then it should be easier. But like these things are needed. They are important. Like this is a discussion that I was having. Like, you know, people are so biased towards the psychological model you know people nowadays they're like you know you're not a real magician if you need tools or you don't need any tools but um what i was going to say is like why my attitude is this why would john d spend painstaking hours over a period of years getting very detailed information very detailed instructions if it was just all in his head and he didn't need it like that's wasting years hours a day like a grueling process of getting this information like if none of this was important then why even go through that process so i don't know what is what is your thoughts on that 
I actually think Steven Skinner put this the best. Um, I believe it was in his Greco uh, Greco magic book, Greco Egyptian magic book, I should say, um, where he stated that, and this is strictly from a scholarly perspective. This has nothing to do with interpretation or mysticism at all. He says, just look at the, the archaeological and historical record, and you will find that magic, the technique, the technology we're talking about here, um, tends to be the same throughout history no matter where or when in the world you're you're looking at it it doesn't matter if it's eastern or western it doesn't matter if it's uh modern or ancient it's the same techniques that keep coming up time and time again even even if cultures are completely isolated from one another they'll still independently come up with the same magical techniques mm. and what so this what are tells the basic us well, what, what are the basic tells? aspects of the technique? Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Well, that's well, that that's kind of a big subject. But the point at this at this at where we're at at this point in the conversation is that if this was all in your head and it was just a fantasy, and you can make it up as you go along, then necessarily in the historical record, that is what you would see. You would see different techniques that are suited to different people at different places at different times. So the fact that it's always the same and it's always the same technology is what tells us that this is objective. It's not all in your head. So, so anything can't just be anything you want. You can replace this incense with whatever and a magic circle. You can just use a magic square and it's all about what resonates and feels nice. What so that's feels not best. Yeah, now see that's now, now this goes right back to what we were saying. You know, these old these old uh, uh, masters did not view this as being psychological. And if you if you do view it as psychological, just like I said to Oshani, none of this makes sense. None of this is necessary. It is outdated, superstitious nonsense. You know, frogs' eyes and eagles' brains and uh, magical timing. I mean, what does it what what difference does it make if I do my spell on Sunday at two in the afternoon or if I do it at Monday at four thirty? What difference does this make to the? It's four thirty. It, it's noon somewhere, right? It, it, okay. It's the day and hour of of uh, the moon. Let's say if I'm supposed to work the moon, it's the day and hour of the moon somewhere. And even if it's not somewhere today, then somewhere in time and space, it's it's that day. So why should I bother with magical time? You know, and it is, if, if it all is just in the head, but the moment you start to see these entities as real, and this, this is the point I wanted to make too, about the magical technology. All of magic, and, and like I said, it, it's the same no matter time or place throughout the world, and so all of magic, it really boils down to this. You are attempting to communicate with an entity that is very different from you in, in a physical sense. They can't really exist in the same place that we can as physical beings. Um, so in order to communicate and meet with these entities in that ambassadorial role I was describing, you have to create a place that both you can exist in and they can exist in. Like a diver going down into a shark tank. If, uh, if, if you want to study sharks, you can stand on the beach and scream shark all day, and none of them are going to come up onto the beach and like study them. You're going to have to go into the tank. You're going to have to get wet. You're going to have to go into their environment. Uh, but at the same time, you can't just jump into their environment. You go out and jump off the side of a boat. You're 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 shark you're shark bait. So you have to create what they call between the worlds. You guys heard that before, right? Let's go between the worlds. Well, this is what that means. You are stepping one foot out of the physical and into the spiritual. You are creating a pocket universe that exists not quite in their world and not quite in our world. And every piece of that technology serves that. The table, the tools, the regalia, the incense that you use, the colors that you use, the numbers of everything that are around. You are creating a sympathetic, magical environment. Uh, just like um, going back to the ATRs. Uh, their familiar spirits are called uh, Ganga spirits, and their Gangas are actually, this is very Goetia, it's, they put them in iron pots, and they'll put chains around the pot, but you know, this binds the spirits of the pot, it doesn't trap the spirit in the pot, same thing with the Goetic brass, uh, the brass vessel in the Goetia, you're not trapping the spirit in the vessel, you're just binding it to the vessel, and then they can work with the spirit, but in that pot, in the Ganga, in the ATRs, um, they will build a microcosm 
that reflects the nature of that spirit. So let's say they have a spirit of the ocean. Their familiar comes from the ocean. They will have fish and seaweed and coral and shells and uh, uh, sand from the bottom of the sea and everything that they can find that they can pack into that pot that will literally turn that pot into a little ocean so that the spirit can live there. And the same thing, if they have one that for the with a spirit from the river, they'll build a little river in that pot. Or if the spirit's from the desert, they'll build a desert environment in that pot. And you're doing the same thing with your magic, with the circles and the talismans and all the all of that, all those accoutrements. You're building an environment, a vibratory space that they can exist to coexist in with you and you communicate with them. So if you take all of that technology and throw it out you're not building that space. You are not opening the lines of communication between you and that spirit. Not to mention the fact that when you do create the tools and you consecrate them properly, they are also living things. They are also real spirits, objective from yourself. Uh, Your tools are your familiars. So your knife is a living creature. Your, Your sword is a living creature. Your wand is a living creature. So when you wield these things in your magic, those spirits are active on the astral. They're doing things for you. And if you say, these are just props, I don't need them, you are literally taking your familiar spirits and subtracting them from the, from the equation. And now you have to do it all on your own. And by the way, you have no idea what it was they did for you on the astral side of things. So again, you're, you're reduced back to being that, 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 uh, a scientist standing on the shore screaming shark, wondering why he's not learning anything about sharks. Yeah, honestly, I think the subjectivist model and psychological model of magic, I think it has its place, but I, I think that it really tends to just ruin grimoire magic to just say, well, anything could be anything I want it to be as long as it feels good and as long as it's it all works in the for me. End. It's all in the intent. And yes, intent is important, but there's an actual technology. These things are there for a reason. Like, why would these things be historically part of this technology for hundreds, even thousands of years, if there was no reason? It's like basically saying, we know better than centuries or thousands of years of magicians because we have our new age books. It's like we know better than them. Correct. But Without the kind of experience that they have. Yeah, as, as you were saying before, Aaron, though, uh, or you were agreeing with that, we, we've established that uh, it, it, they don't know better, essentially, because it's it's not working or it's turning out wrong, and that's why so many people are coming back to this spirit model of seeing things outside of uh, themselves. Yeah. Now, now, I will say one thing. Part of the, the confusion that comes in with this whole psychological thing is that, and I even mentioned this before, there is a psychological aspect to that working magic. You know, um, it, Part of creating that environment is also psychological. Um, one of the biggest pitfalls, though, is that um, spirits are not uh, physical creatures. You know, If a spirit is standing in front of you, there is no body that light is reflecting off to your eyes. When it speaks to you, it's not vibrating air that make that bounces off to your drums. They're communicating to you with what we today would call telepathy. It's mind to mind. Even Agrippa says this. They, they impress their messages onto your mind just like uh, an image impresses itself onto your retina. There's, there's nothing, it's immediate. There's no other medium that has to transmit it to you. Um, uh, unlike sound, where it has to vibrate air in order to get into your ear. Um, so they're communicating with telepathy. They just impress their messages directly on your mind. This is where psychology does come in, because the spirits are limited in their communication with you by what is already in your brain. They cannot present to you an idea or a symbol that is that is not in your brain for them to make you to, to make use of. They can't speak to you in a foreign language that you have no knowledge of because you don't have that language in your head uh, to understand it and to speak in it. And the way they appear, the forms that they take, will depend on your psychology. Uh, You see this a lot in uh, modern religion. Like, how can you have one church 
who worships a Jesus that is loving and kind and gives to the poor. And anyone who walks into that church and says, I need help, is going to get it without question. And then just down the street, you can have Westboro. And <laughs> their Jesus is hateful and sadistic and slimy and evil. Now, they're both Jesus. How do you have this dispar disparity between the two? That's where their psychology is coming in. Westboro is corrupting their Jesus. Their connection to Jesus is based on their mindset. Hate, anger, fear. And therefore, that's what they get from the other side. Whereas the church down the street that is kind and generous and loving, that's the Jesus that they get. So psychology does come into play in it. But ultimately, the Jesus, the force that they're naming Jesus, that they're dealing with, is real and objective. It's just their experience of it, their interpretation of it, that will be subjective. I hope that makes that, sense. Yeah, that goes kind yeah, of about what you were saying with the um, the the two types of the, the evocation, where you had the chain rattlers and the sigil pokers and and that, and then you had the the offering and the the nice way, the reverential way of dealing with the spirits. Same spirits, different outcome. You get what you get, exactly. or you get what you give. Okay. You get what you give. Yes, yeah, so and a lot of a lot of cases, just what you expect. Like, look at D. Um, you know, you it, we have fun going over D's Anakin material because that's cool. But if you really take the time to read his journals, the angels spent a heck of a lot more time giving those men sermons than they did giving him magical secrets. They preached and preached. And I tell you what, some of it is the most fundamentalist uh, 1500s English Protestant nonsense you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> and it's because these angels were coming through in the way D expected them to. Uh, a great ex great example is that that infamous incident where the angels discovered that Kelly was using Goetia behind D's back. And boy, they raised hell. They stopped the session, and we will not go forward even one more inch unless that evil man right there brings all of his evil books to us and formally renounces all the evil doctrines those nasty, disgusting, pathetic spirits told him, and he has to burn all of his goetic tools and books, and then, maybe then, if he's truly repentant, we'll go on with the session. Meanwhile, I've been working with I've been working with these Anakian angels for years, and they have no problem with me working with my familiars or any of the Goetia stuff that I've explored and practiced. They have no problem with it. Because they're not a, they're not approaching me and I'm not approaching them in the way D was. Therefore, they're not approaching me back in that way. I'm not. They're not giving me a bunch of fundamentalist sermons because I'm not wired that way. That's not how I'm approaching them or how I'm perceiving them. Well, uh, not not to confuse these systems and not to like blend things together, but just to use an analogy that many modern occultists could you know relate to it seems sort of like how the light now that i'm saying this i didn't even bring it up this is not kabbalah folks but just to bring in this symbolism it kind of struck me as kind of like the light of tiferet or higher consciousness filters through yesod to reach us like it filters through uh, the mind basically subconscious or what whatever you want to say kind of like that it's like a filter or like it Absolutely. passes through the sieve and your your subconscious is always going to affect what you see uh when you work with these spirits absolutely um uh, switching gears a little bit if you guys don't mind um one of the one of the most powerful one of the most impactful and yet very little understood uh, systems of grimoire magic is the Abra Melon. And mm -hmm. I know that you actually teach a class on the Abra Melon. Um, are, you, are you still accepting, or is that an ongoing type of thing, or could you tell us a little bit about your class and what you offer? The class was uh, kind of a unique idea. Um, it's not just, well, you can just take the class. It's uh, only one class a month, and I do it for seven months. Um, and it, I'll go over step by step the entire process and all of the philosophy and context behind it and, and what it all means. Um, 
But what makes the class unique is it wasn't really set up just to be a class. If it, if it had been that, I just would have had it once a week until it was over. Um, but I actually wanted this to be, uh, I wanted to have the set up so the students could take the classes um, while they're going through uh, the Abermellon process. So the first class was in March, um, just before Abermellon started. Uh, actually, about three weeks before Abermellon began for this year, which began on uh, March 31st, I believe it was. And then um, we haven't even done the second class yet. That's going to be on the 21st, so in just a few days. And on top of that, um, I also, uh, per month, uh, you can sign up for um, consults as well. So it's kind of a package. Uh, you get the classes for free if you sign up for the consults. And that way you can, t you can communicate with me a couple of times a month um, just on, you know, questions that you have, you, you want to know if you're doing things right. Um, there's no group working. It's not like the class gets together and does an Abramelon. In fact, in the class group, I've kept the students from talking to each other too much, um, other than just giving advice and, and helpful hints. Um, but other than that, everyone goes through it by themselves, but you do have resource not only to me through the consult, but also to the group um, if you have questions or concerns. So it's just a, it was a nice way because you know when I like I said when I did it no one was doing this no one even knew what a grimoire was no one wanted to touch them if they did know what grimoires were hell I was being told to leave those silly things alone and, and and get on with real quote unquote real magic which by that they meant psychological magic, um, but I had to do it all by myself so if I had a doubt I just had to wait until it was over and ask my angel you know. <laughs> So I, I just had to push forward through blind faith through so much of it. And I thought it would be really nice um, and, and safer because uh, not only do students need somebody to, to sound off of and, and ask questions of, someone who's been there before, um, but it's also, I, I've seen people, I've, I've had people, students come to me, uh, not my students, but I've had students, aspirants come to me and ask for advice and help through their Abermelon. And I've always been willing to do that simply because I knew how hard it was to be alone when I did it. And several, I would say at least twice, I had some, I had an incident where they would get all the way through the operation, the months of preparation, and they would get right to that final seven days. And that's where the actual rite of Abramelin is, that seven day uh, process. And I would find out they didn't have any idea what they were doing. They didn't know how to contact the spirits. They didn't know how to scry. They didn't know, they were like, okay, what do I do? And I'm like, well, this is not the time to be asking this, buddy. You should have told me this six months ago that you didn't know any of this stuff. So I realized that the best way forward for people is to have a structured class where they can learn step by step how to do the operation and then have a fallback to ask me further questions if they need to. So that's going on right now. I'm still letting people in um, if they just want to take the classes. Um, because you, uh, we record all the classes and they've only missed the first one so far. So you can jump in at any point and just listen to the previously recorded classes, still participate in the group. Um, but if you're wanting to do Abramelin, you'll want to, you know, wait till next year because it's already started for this year. Awesome. Um, and I just, you know, I just want uh, listeners out there to, you know, have a little information on the different range of services that you offer and, you know, different ways to get in touch and, and access your material. Um, of course, uh, you've actually got probably the most active grimoire group on Facebook. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I think it's Solomonic Secrets of the Grimoires. Is that right? Yep. That's it. And Solomonic and then the subtitle is the title of my book. <laughs> yeah, it's like a really active group. So uh, when I upload this to YouTube or wherever I upload it to, Facebook, whatever, I'll be sure and put a link uh, to the Facebook group. So any seekers that are you know listening to this podcast that are interested, if you're on Facebook, you need to join this Facebook group. And you'll be able to access a wealth of material and be able to talk to people that have a lot of knowledge on this subject matter. And um, also, so yeah, I'll be sure and put that in a link uh, in the description. So what what is the story behind that group? Like how exactly did you get started with the Facebook group? Well, it actually began uh, back in the old days when everyone was still using Yahoo groups. 
Um, uh, there was my group, which I think was called Secrets of the Grim Wars then too. Um, and a couple others, uh, the Abermellon group run by Athena Wallander and, uh, some others. Uh, they were really active back in the day. I mean, we did a lot of really good work. That's where I met Jake Stratton Kent. That's where I met Brother Malak, a lot of these guys. Um, I think Joseph Peterson was in there, if I recall. But at any rate, once, uh, you know, Facebook came out, I held out against Facebook for so long. It was like the board coming for me. You will be assimilated. And eventually I was. Mm-hmm. So I finally got onto Facebook. And I was glad I did because uh, it wasn't all, relatively speaking, it wasn't that long before Yahoo Groups completely imploded. I don't know. Did you guys ever use, were you guys ever on Yahoo Groups at all back in the day? Not yeah, really, no. I did a little bit. <laughs> Do you remember when they imploded, when they completely revamped the entire system and made it almost impossible to even use the groups anymore? You couldn't search the archives. You couldn't. I mean, it was terrible. But at any rate, that's when I just decided to, I'd had enough. I mean, YouTube, uh, Yahoo has been changing things a lot, and that was the last straw. So I went over to Facebook, and I just imported it over there and invited everyone from the old group to the new one. And, of course... On Facebook, I had made connections with, you know, people like, uh, well, Joe Peterson. Uh, I think I, I may have known him from previously, actually. No, I did know him from previous, actually, because um, he gave me permissions on a lot of the material I used in my Enochian books. Um, but uh, let's see, Jake Kent came from the old Solomonic group with me. Um uh, took me a while to convince him to get back onto the Facebook, in fact. Uh, he had left it. Uh, who else uh, did I have in there? Uh, you know, um, Frater Ashen Ashan, uh, is a pretty popular name right now. I got him in there. Brother Malak was in there for a little while. He's moved on since. But I just tried to gather together, you know, my friends and stuff that I knew were kind of the big movers and shakers in this particular movement. And, uh, got them all into one place. And, uh, for anyone who's wanting to join, uh, I, I should warn you, uh, from the very beginning, it has been probably the strictest group you'll ever encounter. Uh, on Facebook, um, we, you have to answer three questions to get in, and you have to answer them right. <laughs> a lot of people get denied because they don't answer the three questions. Uh, once you get in, the topic is strictly classical, old school, pre Golden Dawn, Solomonic magic, and related subjects. And so people want to come in and they want to start talking about magic in general or just have general psychological discussions or philosophical discussion. They want to talk about the Kabbalah, the Golden Dawn. A big one is they want to talk about Aleister Crowley. All this stuff is off topic. So none of that is allowed in there. It's a very low noise to signal ratio. You're going to be able to get in there and see good discussions and actually come away with something that will change how you practice and expand your understanding of the material. It's a resource is what it is more than just a discussion area that that really kind of inspired us uh combined with kind of a negative experience um robert and i you know we were trying to be open-minded and we worked with this psychological model with this individual which you know of course i'm not going to name any names but we used like this really psychological model kind of a new agey approach to contacting spirits like you know we visualized a sigil in our throat chakra as we drifted off to sleep and we're trying to be open-minded but we had like a really negative experience using this method it was it was horrible and we've talked to other people that have had a negative experience using this shoddy method and this individual, which, again, I'm not going to name any names, but, like, just totally wrapped up in the psychological model, that combined with kind of your group kind of inspired us to create our own Facebook group where it is specifically just for people that want to go by the book grimoire method. Because, like, there's so many groups that talk about uh, you know, chaos magic or Wicca or Thelema or whatever. Like, there's virtually nowhere where you can actually go buy the book Grimoires. And if there is a place that is open to that, where there are people that are knowledgeable. So that kind of inspired us to create our traditional Grimoires and classical magic group. So, yeah. I've been in there reading through that one, actually. I, I think I joined it maybe a month ago or so. Yeah. And uh, another thing I want to go over is um, uh, Doc Solomon Curio Company. I hope I said that right. Uh, I ordered Doc your. Doc Solomon's Occult Curios. 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. The one. That's I the ordered... word I was missing. <laughs> I knew it was yeah, something. I... We were talking about it beforehand, and I'm like, uh, I'm like, is it is it a, is it a Doc Solomon's Curio cabinet? I can't remember what it's called, uh, but I knew yeah. Curio was in there somewhere, and I was missing a word. All right, continue. Sorry, yeah. guys. I... <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah, I, I ordered your occult calendar, and I found it to really, really be awesome. So what all do you offer with the uh, Doc Solomon like uh, what all what all do you have? I know you have like sell oils that have been blessed by a priest, obviously because you're an ordained priest, and like all kinds of stuff, occult books or, or what all do you have? Yeah, the whole the whole concept of the of Doc Solomon's was uh, to uh, create an occult shop that specializes in the old magic, uh, special especially the grimoires. That's why I wanted the Solomon name to be uh, in the title of the store. Um, so that people know this is where you can come to get Key of Solomon materials. And, uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that the grimoires call for that you're not even going to find in, say, hoodoo or, 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 uh, voodoo shops like botanicals. You're not going to find threads spun by a young virgin. Uh, you know, you're not going to find, uh, uh, archangel oils and planetary oils and you're not going to find planetary. Like, you can go into any botanic and find tons of floor wash, but you're not going to find them dedicated to seven plants. So, you know, the incenses, oils, uh, uh, standard Solomonic holy water, epiphany uh, holy water. We've got stuff that's been blessed via mass. We have, uh, most of our, uh, items are, ble- are consecrated, uh, according to the Key of Solomon the King. Uh, we make custom talismans, magic circles. Uh, uh, right now we're expanding into revealing and robes. And later this year, we're going to be expanding again into things like uh, knives, uh, like the black and white hilted knife, um, wooden trumpets, bells. So all these really obscure things that you need to do this old magic. But because this is kind of a new and, and, and growing movement, there wasn't really a resource for people to do that. Um, unless you did have the resources to make all this stuff yourself, which can take, as I know, decades <laughs> to, to actually get everything together. So I just thought it would be nice to have this resource. Well, and of, of course, not only do we sell the object, um, but we do services as well. We do candle lightings on the archangels. We have uh, altars set up in our homes, all seven archangels of the planets. So we'll light candles on any archangel altar someone wants, and, and we actually perform a whole spell. We read the petition, burn incense, and it's a whole little ritual we do. Um, we consecrate talismans, uh, and in if you have a big need, we'll actually do the patients. We'll actually call in the spirits and uh, question them and, and give you the answers that they give. So it's, we try to basically cover everything in the grimoire and, and Western old magic uh, uh, area of, of occultism. Uh, can I can I ask you something on, along those same lines, Aaron? Um, as a, a an aspiring uh, priest and occult, I don't want to say businessman. As it were, but how do you do? You ever receive uh, opposition to those certain people that say, "Oh, well, you're you shouldn't be charging money for these services or or, or things of, of that nature." And and how do you deal with that? How would you advise someone like myself or maybe other people out there that that feel this is their their calling and uh, to do this somewhat uh, on a on a professional level as well? Um, and and how how do you um, like, what do you say to those those critics, those people that that say, "Well, you're this should be uh, a free service, and, uh, and and you're 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 watering down the the, the spirituality mysticism in it." Well, uh, um, <laughs> first of all, when I began the store, I, I struggled with that myself for a long time before I even set up the store. You know mm-hmm. how. Because, I mean, let's face it, you can take something that is pure and holy and then you monetize it and then it can go right into the crapper. Because mm-hmm. once you become dependent on it for your next meal, all sorts of bad things happen. You know, and this is how you get these evangelists up on stage ripping people off for thousands of dollars. Because yeah. It's just a little by little, they cut a corner, cut a corner, cut a corner. Well, it doesn't matter if I do that. I can just do this. And, well, the client won't know that I didn't do this. I'll just tell them I did. And it can get really bad. So I worried about that happening. But um, I, um, two things. Number one, 
uh, when I took the plunge and did it, I have had that reaction that people so much less than I thought I could. Honestly, I honestly thought I would hear that constantly from people. And I think I've heard it maybe once or twice since I started. And in those cases, it was a specific, it was in, in, not, not both cases, one individual, but in each case, it was an individual who had their own personal acts to grind. It really had nothing to do with spirituality or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, now in general though, because I have had people ask me that same question, you know, well, do you have people attack you for charging money for spiritual things? Or do you feel that you're doing the wrong thing? So here is the answer I get. It's the same on my spirits. My spirits, oh, by the way, this is also what you'll hear from people in the ATR. My spirits have spent decades slowly and painstakingly drilling the mysteries into my thick skull. Now, they expect me to go out and use this for my community. They don't want me to just sit here at home and be proud of myself for all of my knowledge and then die and have no impact on the world. I, this is even in the book of Abramelin. If you don't use it to help the community, it will leave me. So I want to use it to help my community. But if I give away for free what they worked so hard to give me, they will kick my ever-loving ass. <laughs> because people, val- people put value on things for what they pay for them. And I spent years of my life, I have a directory in my email called Magical Help, and it is absolutely stuffed to overflowing with years of my trying valiantly to help people for free. And it is also stuffed with years worth of those same people not taking my advice, not listening to me, and valuing my advice for exactly what I charge. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. No, the other. So in, in other words, people are, uh, it's that whole you get what you pay for type of thing, and they're, uh, 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 if, if they dip into their pocket to, to pay for a service, they're going to follow through with those instructions. But you're saying because they're invested now. So I better do this right to get the result. Correct. And, and not only that, it invests them, and it's kind of a sacrifice too. You work hard for your money. I mean, every dollar you have in your hand represents an hour, or not an hour, but a some fraction of an hour of your labor at your boss's job where you are essentially a slave to another human being. That's important. So if you, if you are willing to let go of some of that to get what you're wanting, you know, to get something that you need in return, that is a sacrifice in its own way, and it shows the spirit that you're actually serious. The one who just sits there and goes, no, I want you to help me and I want you to apply all of your uh, years of experience and knowledge and blood, sweat and tears and hand it to me for free. There's there's no respect there. The spirits are not going to respect me. The spirits are not going to respect him. And he's not going to respect me or himself. And it's uh, honestly, it's it was such a waste of time. Uh, in fact, um, I didn't start charging money because I set up Doc Solomon. This is actually a, an interesting point. I started charging money way back um, I, uh, when I was doing, when I was giving people advice and trying to help them for free. I eventually put a $50 price tag on it, not because I thought it would help me make any money, but because I wanted to stem the tide of people demanding my help. <laughs> it was literally a way of bottlenecking. I didn't want their $50. I hated taking the money from them when they would pay. But I knew that if I didn't do that, again, all of that respect stuff would come into play. But then also, I would end up with another avalanche of people wanting free help. So, you know, I put a $50 price tag on my consult, and I put a $10 price tag on Limpia interpretations, because my God, you don't know how many of those I was getting. And once I did that, it st- it stopped. a lot of it stopped. And then I would only get serious people who really were interested in what I had to say. And so, yeah, it does make a huge difference. And, 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 and before I, before I let you guys go on to the next question, I do want to point out too that there's also another side of that coin. Everything that I was worried about before I started charging money or before I went into this as, as a business and made it my livelihood. Um, I think the reason why I get so much less of the attacks on, oh, well, you're charging money is because of the way I go about it. Um, I charge the bare minimum I can I can make myself charge and then I'll usually knock a little off from there. 
I've been told by so many of my friends and other entrepreneurs, you charge too little, you're scamming yourself, you're only, you're only, you know, dicking yourself out of all of these profits, you know. You're you're selling maiden spun thread for ten dollars a yard. Do you know anywhere else in the world where you can buy maiden spun thread? You could be charging a hundred dollars a yard. And I always just I always just shut those people down. Because that's where you're gonna start getting people saying, Hey, you're just doing this for money. <laughs> because you're trying to right. maximize your profits. You're trying to see what you can get and, and every little dollar that you don't get. You know, I I, I, I when my friends say they have problems, I'll say, let me light a candle to you on our Raphael altar, or let me light a candle to you on our Michael altar, and I'll do it, you know? That's $20 that I'm not getting paid for that ritual, and I don't care because that's not what I'm there for. Mm -hmm. And everyone out there who does pay me $20 to light candles for them, they're helping this person who didn't, who couldn't pay me the $20, or who I just offered to do it for free, you see what I'm saying? So it yeah. all comes together, and everything balances out, and everybody gets help. I can eat and my daughter can eat and no one seems angry at, at me for that and I'm not trying to rip you guys off and try to maximize every little cent I can get at, uh, for the services and the product I offer. You, you never stray into the televangelist way because you do it in a fair and respectful manner for your time and uh, and, and, and people know, and, and it's good quality too. So um, uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, we, we strive for it. That's for sure. Well, I'll definitely be hitting you know, if, if you're getting into garments too. I I I don't sew, so I make most of my own stuff. But I don't sew, so you know, you'll be getting an order from me here in the future. Uh, awesome. Yeah, we're getting that yeah, sewn uh, now. That'll be soon. Yeah. Um, whatever the case may be, I think that uh, that's incredible. That there's actually a shop or a place where you can actually get stuff that you need. For working with grimoire magic because there are many different places where you can get stuff like you said for hoodoo or you know root work or, or, or whatever uh lukumi you know or wicca metaphysical supplies you know crystal balls but there's really not a whole lot to choose from when you need something that's specifically from a grimoire and a lot of a lot of the stuff out there that is for grimoires is not up to par. It's like a styrofoam circle or something. I mean, it's like really not like people need things that are are serious. So I think I think that's incredible. So yeah, yeah we uh, absolutely everything we make, abs absolutely to the the spec that the grimoires require. So if something. If a plant has to be gathered on a specific day and hour, that's what we do. If rituals and prayers have to be done over it at a specific time, we do those. So everything is done properly and consecrated properly. And that, that's really where I think we stand out from, from the other stuff. So like I said, the others are just giving you objects. But we're actually creating magical, living magical tools that, that we can then bequeath, I guess you could say, to other practitioners yeah. and actually get good yeah. use out. Yeah, the yeah. things you offer are actually specifically what the grimoires say. I think I remember here not long ago you were looking for, I think, some hazel wood that was Still able, to be, for it. <laughs> able to be struck <laughs> directly at the, you know, virgin and struck at the day and hour of Mercury during the moon waxing in Virgo or, or whatever. Like, yeah. the things that you provide are the real deal. It's, it's you know, Absolutely. for someone that... For someone that wants to work with a grimoire, buy the book, or, or at least, you know, fairly close, that's the place to go. So yeah, uh, Doc Solomon, um, and uh, I will I will put a link to that in the description. You know, like I said, wherever we post this podcast, I will put a link to Doc Solomon. Uh, uh, once again, for those that are on Facebook that would like to connect. Um, you have Solomonic Secrets of the Grimoires. Again, I'll put a link in the description box. Um, and as I said in the beginning, you have some really excellent, really awesome books out there. Uh, like I said, there's not a whole lot of information out there for this stuff. Uh, you have not a lot of really good quality modern authorship on, on this uh, theme. So, uh, for example, you have Secrets of the Magical Grimoires. 
and and in that in your in your secrets of the magical grimoires, like you really go into depth into sort of the technology behind it and 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 things like that. And uh, essentially, Nokian grimoire, like I said, that is the best book, uh, hands down, that I've read on the subject. Um, and then you have angelical language. Uh, you have several volumes uh, that go into the syntax, the grammar uh, of the Enochian language. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, so everyone, be sure. Uh, where should they buy your book? Should they go to uh, Amazon or to your website? Actually, yeah, I sell all of my books uh, right through the Doc Solomon's website, so you can get them there. And I sell them autographed, so I sell them for retail. Uh, it's a little more expensive than you'd buy at Amazon, but it's the same pr- price you'd pay if you got it out of a store or directly from the publisher, plus I saw autograph them for you. Yeah, so everybody, support your occult authors out there. Uh, <laughs> go, to Aaron's, go to Aaron's website and uh, buy directly from the source himself. Absolutely. Absolutely. The books there, I have the classes there. Basically, everything centers around Doc Solomon's website, so you can find everything there. Do you have uh, a favorite book of yours? Uh, which one that you was maybe enjoyed working on more than another, or one that was more difficult than than the other, or uh, anything like that? Well, I would have to call the most difficult uh, the Angelical Language, Volumes One and Two. Um, that was actually a ten-year project. Oh wow. Yeah, I was uh, back in the back in the old days. There was a email list. If you guys remember email lists before they had groups, um, there's an email <laughs> list called Enochian L, and uh, there's some really big movers and shakers. Benjamin Rowe, uh, the late Benjamin Rowe, bless his soul, he was on uh, there. And he was a m- massive uh, scholar uh, where it comes to Deep Enochian system. Clay Holden was there. I mean, really big, really big names, names you would recognize today, and they were all there. Um, and I'll tell you what, we hashed out these journals, I mean, in every detail. I mean, we would quote passages and then debate and argue over how the placement of a comma in the phrase changed what it might mean. I mean, we deciphered and broke down everything. And I took what we were doing there and, of course, my own explorations into the language and that all went into those two books. And yeah, that took 10 years to write. So as far as difficulty goes, that one was the biggest and most involved and difficult project. Um, the so a lot that, of time and effort and a lot of, a lot of research. Like you've been doing this stuff for a long time. So there's a lot, yeah. a lot it's going into this. A few years now, I'll tell you what, I've been doing this since I was about 15. Um, but if you if you count when I got uh, Don Craig's book as the actual official start of it, I guess I was probably about yes, I guess I was 18 by that. And so yeah, I've been doing it like that ever since, <laughs> nonstop. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we're getting towards uh, well, we've been it's an hour and a half about uh, getting towards the end of our uh, podcast. Does anyone have any more? Questions or anything for Aaron? Um, just a, just one more thing, if you don't mind, real quick. Um, I, I know at, at least it, right now your your primary focus, as uh, we've been talking about this most of this uh, podcast, uh, is the Solomonic style um, and uh, classical grimoire magic. Uh, but also, I know that you also are prominent in the Wiccan community in uh, the the world of neo paganism. Has that changed any of your uh, relationships um, in, in in that style of, of magic at all? I, I know sometimes we, you know, uh, we may have to have you on for a part two to get into something like this. <laughs> but uh, uh, sometimes, you know, people have a, a, a you know a bad aftertaste when 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 we do the whole Christian thing. And and it's hard for them to get past that. And that ha, have you noticed that in with the with like the particularly um, the people that that consider themselves to be pagan or Wiccan, neo Wiccan? Uh, me as as a pagan, um, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a strict polytheist, and you know we can get into that in a, a, another time. But uh, 
do has that changed any of your, your magical relationships and uh, among peers or anything like that? The fact that you're so focused on what seems to be at least a Christian, Judeo-Christian form of magic. Surprisingly, no. Uh, back awesome. when I started this, I could definitely see that happening. Like I told you, I was I was told several times by call you know by friends and colleagues, especially in the neo pagan community, oh that's that's Christian, that's Old Testament nonsense, patriarchal, you know, spirit beating, spirit enslaving nonsense. Uh, you know, stay away from that stuff. And I when I God, when I published Secrets, I expected to get a massive blowback from that. I expected to get hate mail. I mean, literally. And I didn't. And um, I've been very amazed. Like, uh, as you said, we are still prominent in our local neo-pagan community. Uh, uh, Florida Pagan Gathering is something we're heavily involved with. Um, I'm one of their regular headliners there. And even I have been amazed at the reception that the material I teach gets there. I mean, the lectures are always packed. They, uh, you know, need the 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 um, the hang up against anything that might have a Christian origin or even a Christian connotation seems to have really kind of dried up in the neo pagan community. It doesn't seem to be the big um, offensive thing it used to be. In fact, just the opposite. Um, we just had a, a situation. Uh, this is a, a couple of years ago now in FPG, where there was a lot of drama. A lot of people who had been associated with FPG broke away and went their own way, and there was some hurt, hurt feelings and stuff. And um, uh, trying FPG to get a point being on this, Florida Pagan Gathering is that what FPG stands for? FPG, yeah. Sorry, yeah, that's okay. the, the, the Florida Pagan Gathering, and. Um, so they they had you know they they, they had kind of the, the, the shake up and now I'm trying to remember what point I was about to make about the big shake up at MPG. The uh, Christian um, but uh, aftertaste dried up. The Christian aftertaste. Yeah. That's what it was. The point yeah. I was going to make was that during that little blow up, there was more than one pagan um, who stood up and said, "Oh, you know, these people who are against us are acting like a bunch of Christians." You're acting like fundies. You know, you can't act like that if you're going to be here in a bunch of pagans. And I was shocked at the community backlash against anyone who said anything like that. Like they stood up and said, hey, you know, we've got our problems here, but there's no need for you to sit here and bash good Christian people who are practicing their faith like we are. You know, why Why is someone bad just because they're Christian? And I saw them shut those people down, and my mouth is hanging open because, boy, back in the 90s, uh, another good example, you know, Lon Milo Duquette? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, he, he, does these, uh, he does these music shows. Oh, the things he used the, to do back with Poke Runyon and stuff, too? He, I know they used to go on the road and do their little uh, thing. Yeah, well, and, they, yeah. and he does folk songs and stuff, especially pagan folk songs. And a couple of them are making fun of Christians. Back in the 90s, he got famous doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, the last time I heard him, the last time I heard of him singing one of those anti-Christian songs on stage, they tore him to pieces. Oh, wow. They <laughs> said, you know, how dare you? You know, you don't want Christians bashing us, but then you're going to get on stage and bash them. So, you know, what, what, what I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not saying that Lon is a bad person or anything, but I'm just showing how the, the, the times have changed and the yeah. attitude when I started, you were bad if you had anything to do with the Kabbalah or anything biblical. And now, yeah, like I said, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with the local pagan community, and they are very interested in learning what I have to teach at my workshops. So I've been pleasantly surprised in that area. That's cool. Yeah, I, I think it speaks to how your product is good, and you, you people can tell you're genuine. So I just, you know, mad respect for, for that. And we, as a community, as a fellow pagan, uh, you know, I, I thank you for, for that and, and uh, putting out good information. Go ahead, Tyson. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut Yeah, you. I was just going to say, I think that's, well, it was kind of on a personal note with myself, but uh, we could probably do that another time. But I just, I just want to say on a personal note, kind of bringing it to home for me, um, I, I began, you know, my occult path. Well, I grew up in Texas, and it's a lot of, I guess, narrow-mindedness here. So it's kind of natural to have... I guess a rebellious backlash, you know, especially when you're younger. So like when I was younger, I'm not going to lie. I was angry at Christianity and, but, uh, I, I consider myself a pagan, but really I consider myself a Christo pagan because my attitude is that 
I'm a polytheist. I look at the Christian God as just another deity. I don't, I don't really see the problem with working with, like, let's say Horus or Zeus or whatever else, Thor, and then working with Yahweh. It's just, right. I see it as another deity. And you know, I'm a, I'm a Martinist, and you know, Martinism's really, I mean, it is Christian mysticism and stuff. So, you know, but I'm also a Thelemite and. Mm-hmm. You know, and all this other stuff, and pagan. I, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Like, I'm, at, at least in my own practice, you can do all of the above. And kind of like what you were talking about earlier, like, uh, grimoire magic was syncretic. You know, things aren't just like islands off to themselves. I know that's, right. that's kind of my two cents on that. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, fortunately, I never really had to hang up with Christianity because. In my path, I kind of came through Christianity rather than rebelled against it. I, I rebelled against the church. I re- rebelled against mainstream organized religion. Um, but I, I guess I was just fortunate that rather than deciding that all of Christianity was bullshit, I just decided that the people who were calling themselves Christians were bullshit. There you so go. I, I turned in. <laughs> there it I is. Developed. Yeah, and I, I, I developed my own relationship with Christ and worked that way for a long time before I found paganism and kind of branched out and, and went from there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I always felt the same way. And, of course, remember I told you when I went to Denver and fell in with those pagans, they could tell I was into this whole biblical thing, and that, that was why. I was I was even calling myself at the time a Christian pagan, you know. And then um, so they're like, oh, well, you need this book. They said, this is Catholic magic. They actually called Don Craig's book Catholic magic. This is Catholic magic. Wow. You'll like this. And I, I opened it up, and the first thing I saw was Ata, Gibor, Leolan. Uh, no, actually, it wasn't even that. It was beyond that. I saw the cobbles of cross. So I was saying, uh, I saw for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the Lord's Prayer. I use that for magic all the time. And I knew I had found my book, and that's where I went into the Kabbalah and the more biblical side of, of magic. So I never really had that rebellion against Christian symbolism, I, I should say, you know. It's just as pagan as anything else, as far as I'm yes. concerned. I mean, yes. the Christians weren't the first to use the cross. Absolutely Christ not. is, you know, <laughs> related to older pagan solar deities. I mean, they, for all the Christians who swear that their system is different than anyone that's existed before, they're all full of crap because it's the same thing over and over again. They just put different names on it, but they're doing the same thing the pagans were. So there's no conflict there. Yeah, yeah. for me, like, people will be like, well, you know, Christ is just... Uh, you know, a lot like Osiris is, you know, like uh, on the pyramid text, it hints at him rising and, but like to me, that's never, that has never diminished Christianity for me. To me, no. that just, to me, that validates it because it shows that it's a legitimate myth. It's something that's been repeated again and again. I don't think that that takes away from Jesus. It To me, it just, to me, it kind of validates it because it's like, yeah, this is a legitimate mythos basically and like all these great occultists of the last 2000 years for the most part have been Christian I mean we have Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa we have you know John D and Edward Kelly. like we have so many you know Tritemius so uh, Tritemius was actually an abbot <laughs> yeah I mean yep. yeah Absolutely. Of course, it was mixed in with like Neoplatonism and and all of these other things. But but yeah, I don't really see an issue. That, and again, I think that things move in cycles. People go through one, or society rather, goes through one stage and another. And I think that people are starting to come back around to you know not be so opposed to Christianity or so opposed to traditional spirit model magic. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, are, are, it is changing. It is changing very rapidly. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much, and uh, I would like to have you uh, on again sometime, you know, if, if scheduling awesome. permits, and I know that you're really busy and, and all of that. But, yeah, uh, yeah can, thank you very much like for... Yeah, Thank you very much for being on the show, and uh, I hope that uh, all those listeners out there, be sure and look in the description box 
look at the links. If you want more information, like I said, go to the Facebook group, uh, check out Doc Solomon, and uh, you know, check out his website and all of that. So everyone have a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us. And we will see you guys next time.